Hey guys, welcome to our first podcast. But before we start, just a quick word from today's sponsor. Yo, Rod, what are you doing, bro? Trying to catch some fish, bro. No, dude, that's that's your fish tank. You can't. Yeah, but I, can't... I need to fish. I need to fish. I, I'm cold. It's, it's cold out here. I know, here. I but those fish. are your pets. You can't do that here. You got to try this. What is that? Oh, fishing clutch. Oh, dude. dude. In this game right here, you can catch any of these fish that I have and the fish that we sell from all over the world. You can get giant arapaimas, peacock bass, literally any fish you want. Guys, check it out. When you go, you just cast. Dude, if you hook, hook, hold on. That's gotta be a giant fish. Oh, look at that. That's a tiger shovel nose right there. Tiger Suruban. Guys, I really enjoyed this game. I enjoyed the fact that I can catch fish and monster fish, especially from all around the world. If you wanna support the channel, make sure you download Fishing Clash. You can literally catch any fish from all over the world on the palms of your hand. You know, this is really cool for kids as well because you can learn all these fish. So when you actually go there, if you ever have a chance to go to the Amazon to fish, you already know what they are just by playing the game. Really cool. The graphics are amazing, bro. It looks, it looks so real. And they make you work hard for your fish, too. Let's see. Brook trout. You can upgrade your rods and lures, and you have weekly competitions that you can play against people from all over the world. You can actually start your own clan and have your friends compete with each other to see who can catch the biggest fish. It's always me. <laughs> I'm the biggest fish. <laughs> Guys, stuff like this really support the channel and keep the channel going. If you like all this fish and want to support the channel, use gift code PREDATORY to get a $20 reward. When you use a gift code, you get one unique avatar, one mythical lure card, 50 luck power-ups, 30 weight power-ups, all to help you catch bigger fish. Thanks so much for watching and enjoy the video. Make sure to use gift code PREDATORY to get an awesome $20 value reward for free. You're gonna get one unique avatar, one mythical lure card, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help you catch bigger fish. Well, guys, right, cool. this is gonna be our first live. Um, Zanaqua here, Mike, his brother's over there in the other room. You got Kevin, Stingray Biology, and uh, Big Air Pime up here that Paul and uh, Fadi gave it to us. But we're trying to get this podcast going because a lot of you have been asking as well. So if you have any ideas or anything that, anything that you wanna put in, to make it better, let us know. But I think uh, the room came out pretty nice. You did a good job painting it. Yeah, eh. yeah it came out right. John King, you know, <laughs> got the mics. Everything looks pretty, pretty legit. I think we're, we're looking legit. What do you think? I don't know. I, I think so. I. Who do you think's the most excited in this room about this podcast? <clears throat> I Me? think it's him. I think it's John. Is it John, John yeah. behind the well, glass. He did a lot of work. He like coming here, painting it, and things like that. So I think all of us are excited. Uh, we just needed help. Like we're Kevin and I are very busy. So John, I mean, Mike came in here. What, a few nights, right? Yeah, it took well, it took longer than I was expecting because I messed up the paint like three yeah, times. There's still little details <laughs> to do it here and there, but it's yeah, coming like out. That, that white right behind your head. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I left right the tape on too long. <laughs> I left the tape on too long. Sure, yeah, no problem. It's Get too it big. It didn't want it to yeah. go. That so, <laughs> so guys, we're trying to come up with ideas of like, you know, subjects or even like I want to FaceTime people when we do the live to, um, you know, people around the world and we can talk to you and we'll be able to see the tanks and ask you questions on how you got into the hobby. But hopefully this is the first one. It's going to be a pre-recorded one where we can post it. And um, we're just going to talk a couple questions that uh, John got, gave it to us from you guys and um, see what we can come up with. But I think one of the questions that you had was a funny story, right? About something related to fish. Okay. Uh, I will start because I have one. on. You love uh, to talk. I love so to it's talk, all you. Bro. I, you know, I'm a big talker. But when I went to the Amazon with, with uh, Joey, I think I told you this. We were pulling up to, the, to this tribe and they, they never really seen outsiders, which is really insane. They don't have cars. They don't have electricity. TVs, none of that. It's just jungle, you know, rainforest. That's it. You don't, they don't do anything else but hunt, eat, and make babies. That's it, which is great. So, as we were walking up to the island by boat, I told Joey, I said, "Hey, um, it's very disrespectful if you look at them in the eye before they talk to you first. So he looked at me and he's like, <laughs> "You shitting me?" I'm like, "No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Like, you have to wait for them to talk to you first. Then you look up and you make eye contact. Once they stop talking, you have to look down or they will kill us. So the whole day, you know, Joey's like filming for his YouTube channel. He's like, hey, guys, I'm here in, in the Amazon, but I can't look up. So he's like looking down the whole time. <laughs> and um, when the the chief of the tribe came over and he started talking, Joey looked up and he's recording. And it was so funny because like as soon as the guy walks away, he looks down again. <laughs> so the whole day we're walking around. Joey's looking through the floor, trying to film everything. And at the end, I was uh, 
same buy on my video. And I was like, Joey, Joey, come here. He's, I was like, how was it, bro? How was the experience? He's like, dude, I thought I was going to die every second of the day because <laughs> I was afraid to look up. I was like, no, nah, bro, I was just kidding. You could have looked up. And that ended the video. He was like, <gasps> and I ended the video. But it was, uh, it was very funny because it, you see things that you don't see it before. Like, I want to go back to Brazil and, and try to go to that same tribe and be like, hey, I'm going to pay you this much. I want to live for the whole weekend with you guys. Like, live like you to see if we can even do, you know, the weekend. Like, they're butt naked. You know, you have the, the feathers or the birds that they, I'm sure they, they, they kill to eat, but they use the feathers. They were eating ants. There was a pit bull riding a, no, a, a monkey riding a pit bull. <laughs> a pit bull riding a monkey. <laughs> oh, dude, you, you know what's funny? I saw a video of a monkey riding a pig. I don't know if it was like in Africa or something. I think they just do that. When they get startled, they just find the closest animal to jump on and they- Dude, I'm dead serious. Like, <laughs> and they dart look, away. Somebody gave him a pit bull and then this, this beautiful dog is sitting there and there's little monkeys riding it like a cowboy. They do that. I've seen a couple monkey videos of monkeys doing that. They're smart, they're smart. But yeah. I, that's, that's one of the things I wanna do. I wanna go back to, to the Amazon and try to live like them for a week. I think that'll be a weekend. I think that'll be a really great experience and uh, video as well. Do you have any uh, funny stories related to fish? Not like that. I don't know if I could top that. We should have made you go last. I know, I should have went last. So the, the only one that I could think of in recent memory, I mean, I have a whole bunch of like little stupid things, but- um, Stupid things. <laughs> a little stupid. Yeah, like, you know, like last month I'm sleeping and in my room I have a whole bunch of fish tanks and I hear water running in my room like spraying and I'm like half asleep and I'm waking up like uh, and I see the water shooting out of my fish tank out of the filter because the water got too low and it was spraying water all over my room at like three o'clock in the morning. So I jumped out of bed. It woke me right up and I had to get a bucket of water. I had to top the water off and I had to clean up all the water off the floor and everything. But why was it spraying up and not down? You left the bar spraying up? Because I had a spray bar it tilted upwards slightly so it would agitate the top of the water. And I guess the water got low enough. And you know how sometimes when spray bars get clogged, like it'll force the pressure out of the one or two holes? Mm -hmm. I guess that happened and the water was just spraying all over the place. So I had to clean that up. That was just one. But another funny fish story, just like out of re recent memory. You, know, you guys know how, koi, a lot of people don't know this, but koi fish could jump. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen? So I didn't. I never knew this, and this was at. I don't. I don't know if you were with me, but we were getting the koi fish out of our pond when we were moving out of our old house, and we were moving into the house that we were in now, and we set up a tub in our garage. It's just like a holding tank because my dad wanted to bring the koi fish with us, and I, tr I. I brought him to the new house. I put him in the tub. I was acclimating them, and we had a huge. It must have been you know, a pretty big koi fish, probably like two, two and a half feet. And I've never seen a fish jump higher than, I, than I've seen this koi fish jump. This thing launched out of the tub like a missile. It went probably five feet. Like this thing, I, turn, I heard a splash like Phew! And then I see the koi fish in my driveway, like five or six feet away from where the tub is, laying in the middle of the driveway. I'm like, holy, f I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this, but. I've, I don't know. Boss, that, are we allowed to curse? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sure I could probably think of other funny fish stories, but that's just the first one that popped up on the top of my head. Because so they do jump, yes. Fish, yeah. Like people think, like, oh, yeah, I could just keep a fish without a lid, or like, oh, I've never seen it jump before. <coughs> Especially with like long, slender fish that are easy to, that are like escape artists. Like, uh, like, what are they? Are they really going to get out of my tank? But people don't realize like the that. The fish look like us. They're not really jumping. They're, they're staying in the tank. <laughs> yeah, until it actually happens to you, you don't like. You don't realize it. Has Kevin had any submarines fly out? Like heavy, giant fish? Fly out of the tank? No. I mean, I've had them like come up the side wall and like half their body out. But you had the uh, one that spit water everywhere. Yeah, I had one that spit water when it wanted to be fed. But you went to China, Thailand, Africa, right? Yeah. So well, not Africa, but yeah. India. India. We went. To so India. tell them, tell them some crazy stories, because I I probably haven't heard in half of them. Like one of them that you're like, holy crap! I can't believe this happened. I don't know. I, I it's like I draw blanks honestly. Like unless like something really triggers a memory. Um. 
got to have something good. I'm it? the same way. That's why I can't. I couldn't remember anything off the top of my head. I have to really yeah. think about it. Yeah, I would have to think about it. Give nothing, me a second. Nothing in Thailand with like lady boys and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your story. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> that, 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 that's your story. Oh man! No, we actually we were, we were in Thailand, and uh, thank God Lisa was there. Oh, uh, we were walking. What's the name of that street? Soy like, Cowboy. Dude, I kid you not. Right, we're walking, and like you have all these girls on the street, like trying to get you to the clubs and bars, and then you see this one bar, Lady Boy Bar, and they look good. I'm not gonna lie, it, it, they look better than the actual girls, right? Yeah. Even Kevin. He, that like, was part of the fun of bringing you there. He's like, dude, like these are all dudes, bro. He's like, there's a rule here in Thailand, like if you're looking for a girl, make sure they're short because majority <laughs> of the tall ones, the boys. <laughs> so oh we're walking God. by. We had we wanted to go to the end of the of the street, you know. And as we're walking by, they're trying to pull us in, and I'm like, no. And he's like, yo, don't don't disrespect them because you go to jail here. Like they're protected. So I'm like, well, it's just, all right, you know. So we come back, and we set up this bar, Lisa, Kevin, and I, and I want to make sure that I was not looking at the direction of the lady boys. So I faced the other way. So my back was towards the lady boys. And I'm, we're drinking a beer, and Kevin goes, hey, look behind you. I'm like, no, I'm not looking. He's like, look behind you. I'm like, no. He's like, just do it. And then I turn around, and one of them, of the lady boys, he pulled – Went out, and he was looking at us, pointing at me, going, <laughs> and dude, I, <laughs> even Lisa was cracking up, and I'm like, bro, why you made me look, dude? And he's like, hey, come here, come here. I'm like, nope, nope, thank you so much. <laughs> God bless. No. Um, but that was, um, it was something that you told me before, right? Like, a lot of Thai guys turn themselves into females yep. to make money. To make money, yeah. To make Because they're, you know, they're... They're hard for them to make money over there. Wow. So a lot of uh, outsiders go to Thailand to experience that. You know, we were there for different reasons. We're there for fish. Yeah, okay. And that's, yeah. that's why my <laughs> wife was there as well. What's happening? I hear Ryan. Uh-oh. We're going to have a special guest coming. He's crying. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Maybe he's mad that I, I, I'm talking about lady boys. Uh, we're talking about the, the part where we went to Thailand. He's right there. He's right there. All right, just say, say hi to everybody. Say hi. Hi. Say hi. Uh, <coughs> hello. <laughs> you shy? Um, do you remember that lady, lady bar, lady boy bar, though? Yeah. Do you remember oh. what they did? Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I was just telling them the story. But I wanted you to come here to make sure that Kevin and I went there for a fish, right? Okay. You were keeping him in line, Lisa. Yeah. There's right, nothing, uh, nothing more than fish. <laughs> wow. <coughs> you want to be part of the podcast, buddy? <laughs> He's like, that's the room I used to sleep at. Well, we'll we'll be done so- shortly. Bye, Ryan. Wait, Bye, but Lisa. Kevin never really said his story. I don't even have a story. No, yeah, I, I, yeah. dude, you might have seen something. You had to see something. Like, like my dad one time, I, I he he flew to to Peru for me, and he went to Iquitos, and he said like people were taking dumps on the street, and that's normal. Like, you know, we had to have those big big dresses. The ladies would just just go down and they get up, and there's a pile of crap right there, and they just keep walking. I think people do that in Chicago now too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Los Angeles. Well, what, why is everybody saying like, "Oh, it's Ohio. It happened in Ohio." Why is everything Ohio? It's, it's just a meme. Uh, that's what I because figured. because Ohio is just like such a low key, like nothing. It's a joke that like people feel like nothing ever happens there. So everything happens. So, in Ohio. so it's like, oh yeah, this is the this is the <coughs> thing from Ohio, like you know, and it's just it's just like a stupid thing, and people are like, oh, that's what happens in Ohio, you know. Big rich happened in Ohio. So. <laughs> Stop screaming, boy. All right, come on. You got to think of something, dude. You can't be that boring. Come on. Oh, I'm very boring. <laughs> I'm very serious. I'm a serious person. <clears throat> you but, are. Um, really? No. I, so, so ask Kevin about what, are you, what are some of your goals? Instead of, I'll ask him. Like, all right, instead of a funny, you know, 
What's something you want to talk about? What made why you get you, into stingrays? Why you, All right, I'll ask him that. I'll ask him that. What I, made him get into stingrays? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Are we back on? Yes, we did. Yeah. All right, so if you can't find a funny story here, we'll save it for the future. But yeah. just let's talk about what made you get into stingrays then. Like why stingrays of all the fish? You've been doing this for what, 25 years? Probably longer, yeah. Yeah, I I knew about you before I even knew that you partnered up with Rod because okay. I remember watching. Um, I think I watched a video of like a like a mummified stingray pup or something like okay, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. And That's I think did Big Rich videos. go to your facility too? Did he do a tour? No, Joey. Big did. Rich, no. Um, it was uh, Joey DIY. Jo oh, okay, Joey Mullen. <clears throat> yeah. That's probably where I saw it from then. Uh, probably, yeah. He came and visited. I didn't have a channel back then, but. Um, Afterwards, that and then I, I hooked up with Rod. Not hooked up, but uh, you know, we met. Wait, you we were talking about Lady Boys, <laughs> and now we're hooking up. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, and then he started filling my head with all these YouTube. Is stuff. he now filling your head, bro? Can yeah. you change the subject? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to talk? <laughs> well, talk real. Don't talk like well, we're hooking up, and he's filling my head. Like yeah. it just. <laughs> I said filling, not feeling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Which is worse? I don't know. I don't know. All right, so uh, tell us, right. what, what made you get into stingrays? Well, I was always into fish, right? And then eventually just things get boring, you know, when you're keeping the same stuff. You're seeing tetras, mollies, yeah. guppies, goldfish. I went, th I went through it all. Saltwater, discus, plecos, everything. And then now all of a sudden stingrays come along, mm -hmm. okay? But there's and not many in the market back then, right? No, back then there was none. Yeah. So it was, it was something new and it's cool and it's different. No He's saying, yeah, you weren't even alive, bro. <laughs> Dude, I've been keeping fish. <laughs> I've been keep He'll tell you. I've had fish tanks since I'm like five years old. Yeah, but how old are you now? I'm 27. Yeah, this is this I'm is probably 50. one year. I'm 50 next this week. This is when you're like a sperm, bro. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. Well, okay. So maybe, so you're talking about. So there about was no real stingrays back then. Um, they were just coming, starting to come out of South America. And um, at that time, I was like dabbling in like buying and selling fish as like a hobbyist seller. And I see on a wholesaler's list or an importer's list, tiger stingray. I'm like, wow, tiger stingray. What could that possibly look like? There's no catalogs, no internet. You know, you, yeah. the only way to see what it looks like is to cough up the money and buy it. And Can you back imagine, then, hold on, hold on, sorry. Can you imagine that back in the day? <clears throat> you're trying to buy something. How, do you remember what the price was? I think it was like five, six hundred dollars. And you had no idea what it looked like. And you that's know, wholesale. Wow. That's wholesale. You know? <clears throat> and you know, everything on a list usually is like twenty cents, thirty cents, three dollars, four dollars. That's already five dollars. On a wholesale list, that's like, wow, that's expensive already. All of a sudden there's this item there that's like five hundred dollars. And it's something you've never seen before. And the name Tiger, you know, your your mind just starts mm -hmm. imagining what it could possibly look like. That's so me and a friend, we get together and say, you know what, let's just get it. And we brought it in. And, of course, we all know what a tiger stingray looks like now. Some, some people don't. <clears throat> they're not always available. No, they're not always available. And, yeah, and, and from there, then we just kept checking the list every week or started calling the, the, the whatchamacallit, the, the wholesaler or the importer. Can you get more rays? Can you get more rays? Right? But back then, there was also nothing cataloging it or naming the rays you know so it made it very hard like one week one ray could come in looking like this and then next week the ray could be completely different but the name on the list was exactly the same and that's kind of where like richard ross comes into play where he came up with the whole p numbering system mm -hmm. to help exporters and buyers be on the same wavelength of like okay i want p12 you know, and then they'll look at the catalog. Oh, P12 is this ray. That's the Henley eye and so forth. So he had to go to the Amazon <clears throat> and like no number all each one of he them? He worked with somebody, uh, hold, all these <clears throat> importers in Florida and just said, whatever rays you get, I'll buy them all. I'll buy them all. I'll buy them all. He just kept buying, buying, buying and then housing them and then cataloging them one by one, like taking photos and then numbering it. He created this whole system and then... He published a little manuscript where he sent to the wholesalers and he sent to all the people in South America so that everyone could start using that same catalog system. So it's kind of like the plecos, the L numbers. Yeah. So the L numbers came first and then they, they did the stingrays and called them P numbers. 
So every Stingray has a P number. Um, up to when he stopped cataloging, because you know he's retired now. And if any new rays came out afterwards, then there might not be a number for those. So I haven't followed since then. Can you? Uh, can you do it? Can you? I can pick them? up on his work. Yeah, that that's not a not a problem. But That'd be cool. Yeah. So like, what what would you look for in the differences in the stingrays that would create a new P variant, or just like little tiny minute details? Or are you looking for big things? Or? Big things. Big things that would classify it into its own species. You know. So just because like you have Leopoldi or black diamond, it's still one species. It's just more spots, less spots. You know that that doesn't really make it a different fish. You know, okay. it's like I'm bald and he's not. That we're still human beings. Right. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Human beings. And by the way, before when I was saying that, I remember about the stingrays. It's not like I actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying when, from when I was young, like in the early two thousands. You know, you used to go to pet stores and they no one ever had stingrays. I remember very very vividly in like the late, like 2008, 2009, 2010 is when a lot of these stingrays, I started seeing them at least. I don't know, maybe it was before that. And nowadays, every almost every pet store has some sort of stingray, I feel like. Any any good fish store. Yeah, in the beginning, it was mostly um, what they call reticulated rays and uh, yes. and motoro rays. I used That's to have all reticulated. You would see. Yeah. I used so, to have one. So if you're the pioneer, you know, importing them and starting it, how did it happen for Asia to get them so fast and start breeding? Because now they don't even come from South America anymore. Majority of the no. race come from Asia. Well, I think like with any animal trade, when there's money to be made, then people just jump in. And Asia is one of the first um, countries to usually jump in on animal trade, whether it's for reptiles, turtles, Cats, dogs, you know, you name it, you know, they'll get into it. So stingrays was one of those things also um, that's not that hard to breed. You just need to have space and time and dedication. Um, and, you know, they sold for thousands of dollars. So who wouldn't do it? Even hobbyists at home you know, would do it because the yeah. potential money that could be made. But at the same time, when it grows too big and too fast in all directions, it can also collapse very fast too. Yeah. So, interesting. What is the most expensive ray you bought? That I've bought. Yeah. I I I was so proud of it when I got it, but now I feel like such an idiot because <laughs> same thing, the price collapsed. Oh. But I spent over a hundred grand on, on one on one, oh and it was like God. a four inch little pup that I wasn't even sure it was gonna live or die, you know. And I gambled it, and and I got it. It survived, it grew, it bred, but you know, I don't think I can sell any of her babies now for a hundred grand. So so the market has <clears throat> dropped because other people were breeding other I other animals that looked similar and the price was a lot cheaper. Yes, also, <clears throat> but this was one of those things that a lot of times the pricing was um breeder demand more than hobbyist demand. Oh. Uh. Right? So it's like certain pit bulls, right? Yeah. They, they go for a lot of money. Why? Not because the average person wants to buy it, because the average person wants to buy it to breed it, to make the money. So so like like what Kells has those dogs, right? And he's saying they can sell for like thousands of dollars each, right? Yeah. So he spent a lot of money to get the parents, the brood stock, right? Same thing, in hopes that the pups can sell for that kind of money. So stingrays is, is the same thing. You know, people went after it and the prices went crazy. Because, oh, the nicer it is, the more rare it is, or whatever, I can sell for more money. So is it worth paying 10000 And then when they breed, I can sell the babies for two, $3,000 each. You know, it's a no-brainer when you do the math that way. Yeah. So that's what the driving factor was, really, it I makes think. Makes sense. In that sense. Yeah. But then you got overpopulated. Everybody has it, so the prices drop. Yeah. Now but everyone has it, you know, and then um, people panic, and they want to sell, or they're... They're breeding so much and they don't have the outlet for it. And, you know, they go online, social media, internet, and just one after another. I'll sell for 500 Okay, well, I'll sell for 450 Okay, well, I'll sell for 400 I'll sell for 350 I'll sell, you know? Well, when we were in Asia, there was different facilities that had big, big operations. Yeah. And some of them you didn't even want to go to because they, the quality wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So... How do you see the quality of an animal, like a bloodline, if you're not following? Like, how do you, how do you pick a, a brute stock to to breed? Okay. 
So that that that's uh, <clears throat> that just involves uh, you doing your due diligence and researching. Like same thing with dogs, you look into the breeder, who the breeder is, how reputable they are, if there's a bloodline established. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you would get from a pet store that comes from a, a wholesaler, which imports from Asia, you have no history on where that ray came from and you know how it was bred, what it was mixed with. So it might look nice now, but it can turn into something ugly. There's, there's no way to figure it out. Only thing is to get to know the breeder, who you're buying from, and whether you trust what they say. So you're paying for the traceability of the genes and the history. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like, um, you know, with like with cattle and and beef. You know, that's why the the wagyu cows in Japan are, you know, a hundred dollars a pound, whereas you could get you know three or four dollar a pound ground beef in the supermarket. I guess it's something similar to that, where you know you know where that real wagyu beef is coming from. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It might not even be real. Never We're paying the price. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So what that stingray that you paid a hundred grand for at the time? What was so special about it that you took the gamble that you were like, I have to buy this? It was the well, only one in the world, right? Yeah, it's the only one in the world. It was a Bosmani stingray, uh, and Bosmani stingrays had just been fairly new to the market, and then there was an albino one that popped up in the wild. Okay, wow. so it wasn't man-made; it was right from the wild, so, and that sets the price even higher on it, and. At that time, nobody had it. And any albino strain, uh, the pups were selling at that time, thirty to fifty thousand dollars a piece. Okay, and it wasn't even a, the Bosmani. It was it was pearls and black diamonds. So now this new stingray that just came on the market and albino, and at the same time, the the people who caught it in South America knew what was going on with the the Asia market for albino rays. So they put it up for auction. Oh, so you're bidding on it. I was against... bidding against other billionaires <laughs> probably <laughs> in Asia for it. Um, and so I guess the question everyone's wondering is, so how the hell did I get the Ray if I'm bidding against all these billionaires over there, right? So I kind of used the scare tactic, okay? I told these people, look, I'm already doing business in your country do they speak English? Yes. Okay. So I'm already doing business in your country, doing the Bosmani stingrays, right? Because we're importing, exporting. So we had money there and we, you know, um, and you know who you're dealing with because they knew who I was. And you got this guy in Asia. Okay, let's say he, he bids higher than me. He bids 200 grand. How's he going to give you that money? He's just going to randomly wire you 200 grand into your bank account. It's going to look right. like you're running drugs. So I scared them. My money is right there. I have cash sitting there. I can have some money. Bring you this money right now. Versus you taking the chance of some government or soldiers knocking on your door, you know, saying what's up with this money and this and that, and you get into a whole bunch of trouble. So I said, look, at the time, I think the, the offer was at 80000 or 90000 I said, I'm going to throw in extra Twenty thirty thousand on top. We make the deal right now, and they went for it. And there was a middleman in between, and we kind of like kicked him twenty grand. <laughs> this here's twenty grand. Shut up. <laughs> you know, to to make because it wasn't his Ray. It was his um, aunt or somebody. I, I forget who it was. Somehow, so I I had to give him some incentive as well. So we kicked him a little money convince your your aunt your uncle or whoever it was and let's just make this happen cash will be there within you know hours damn Dude, and talking about home. that's a lot of money over there that's like, like a that's, drug deal yeah that's, that's <laughs> a lot of money like even 20 grand in Suriname was Suriname mm -hmm. it's a lot of money like that's probably just like to, just to have an idea like we should, we should convert that to, to Brazil money right that's almost six times more so a hundred grand USD in Suriname, they became rich, yeah. you know, over one animal. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, that's probably like enough to retire with. Like you just live the rest of your life. Oh, yeah. Like, and you're done. Yeah. The guy who went to pick it up, he, he, he brought a gun with him and everything. Cause we were afraid after giving them the money and taking the Ray, 
he was going to get ambushed and mugged, and somebody was going to steal the ray back. So you're out because he does happen. And, a lot. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. You're out the money and the fish. You know, so, so he went strapped. To That's go get crazy. It. Yeah. He has a picture of it. He's in his car. The bag's on the floor. You can see the yellow, bright yellow fish, and he put. The, he showed me a picture with the gun right in between his legs, and he took a photo for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you paid him enough, you know. But it, it's crazy. Like a lot of these fish deals, it is. It it's it really scary. Like before I met mm -hmm. Kevin, a lot of times I had to send money up front. You know, when I was just starting, and they could just take the money and run. We we heard stories of people that go missing in Peru because they take money from like. Mafia, Russians, or Asians, and they send people there to kill him. And next you know, that guy's, you can't find him anymore. He's gone over, you know, stealing money. Because what they do is, uh -huh. you know better than me, but let's say he's the exporter and he's doing business with all three of us. Yeah. So he has me send the money, but then he's buying his fish, waiting for him to send the money to buy your fish, waiting for him to send the money to buy my fish. You see, so he used my money to get his fish, but now he didn't pay. So now he's screwing me over because he didn't get his money. So he becomes a whole. So it's like a big Ponzi scheme. Peru, I think Peru <laughs> is the is the worst, right? Yeah. At least four people get screwed out of every deal. Like if one batch of fish comes in, a handful of people are gonna get screwed because only one person gets the fish, but it gets promised to everybody. Then people start sending their money in, <clears throat> and yep. then cash and carry. Whoever shows up with the money first. So even though okay, even if you left deposit, it's not enough. All right, so if a fisherman says, okay, hey, I got this batch of fish here. Okay, you go to your customer, you go to your customer, I go to my customer. Okay, Rod says, I'll take it. Here's 500 deposit. I'll get you the rest of the money, you know, within a week. Doesn't matter. You can just walk right in, give him cash, and take the whole thing and gone. Now he's out the money, and then they'll be, oh, don't worry, I'll get it for you. Or they'll just stop answering your phone, yeah. you know, it just disappears. The, the first guy I dealt with, um, he's like, oh, I'm a big exporter, this and that, I was... I was like talking to him in Spanish. I would, at least I would be asleep. I would be on the computer like overnight talking to people all over the world. And uh, my dad, my my grand, my grandmother, my mom, my dad's mom's from Peru. So my dad was in Peru and he flew to Iquitos to meet Camilo. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when he got there, he was just a taxi driver. So he just had connections, you know. But one of the funny things that he said is like he's walking around the streets and he even though my dad looks Spanish. People could tell that he's not from there. Like, they're looking at him. Everybody's staring at him. And uh, Camilo goes, hey, you hungry? He's like, yeah, I'm hungry. And they go by, and there's a little gr grill in the street, and the guy's, like, selling food. And he's like, how many you want? He's like, oh, a skewer. Okay. And then he opens the, uh, it's like a, a Home Depot bucket, and he's, he got these maggots. Like, remember Lion King? Mm -hmm. when, when they're eating those huge maggots? So they start putting them on the skewer and put it on the grill for you to eat. What? Yeah. Dude, it's it's crazy. I mean, you've been in other countries like that, right? Like yeah. even Thailand, they had uh, um, fried bugs, uh, fried worms, right? Mm -hmm. We had a challenge. I had to eat almost like a potato chip because it's so fried that there's nothing left. But yeah. the the maggot ones, they're alive. Oh, I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't put that in my mouth, bro. It just goes to show how different things are here in the United States than in other countries. You know, like they don't have the laws and the regulations like we have here. So that's what leads to a lot of this you know, this shady business that you have to do, you know? Yeah, I mean, over there, it's a free-for-all, you know? You could still pay, and you could still kidnap you for no reason, you know? Uh, a lot of times people think, oh, you importing, you make more money. You have to know the right people, and you lose a lot, and even knowing the right people, sometimes they get screwed by their own fishermen. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough business. Yeah, I bet. You know, we, we discussed one time, sometimes we make more money, you know, just getting the bread and butter stuff from different wholesalers and not have to worry about big in, bringing a big order in because when you do that, you put a lot of money on one fish, you have to pay a lot in freight, then you have to care, cater for that fish when you could have just got a few of different species and not have to worry about a whole shipment, Yeah, you know? But we do it just because I think mainly we like it, number one, is is it's keeps you like entertained because you see different things every day um, and now because of who we are we do have connections all over the world which makes it easier for us to be able to import you know like yeah. we open a facility in Thailand and we have our partner in China we got people in Brazil so it's like it's easier to get fish from the whole world without having to worry about is it good quality you know we're going to lose money 
Uh, sometimes things happen with the with the airlines, but that's just like us shipping UPS. You know, if they screw up, there's nothing. We it's can part do of the like business. That. Part of the business. There's no way around it. But that was that was crazy. Another crazy story. Oh, you got to redo it again. No, you're good. You're good. It's been a half hour already. Oh, okay. You want to talk about the the phantoms? Listen, man. We could just use that as a like. Because I think after this is gonna be a while. With the phantom red tails. Mm-hmm. Well, you're gonna right. save that for another day. You know? We could save it for another day. Okay. You can give up too much all at one. I mean, that stingray story is already a big story. That is. You know. And this is this is gonna be that, like <laughs> right away. Yeah, and this is like a a test episode, like a pilot episode, anyway. So. Do you um, still have that photo? Or no, I have to find it. It's on my other phone, the confiscated yeah, phone. Uh, it'll be so funny if it, the, he said, oh, the photo with the guy with the gun or the stingray. If we can get, yeah. <laughs> That'd be yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so why don't you talk about your Google? Okay, so changing subject, a lot of times people, we have a lot of calls and people are like, are you open? Why are we not open? You want to explain to them? Because I answer those phone calls sometimes, and it's I feel bad because they sometimes they're at the door, and they're like, oh, I just want to come in. Basically, I'll say a little bit, and I'll let Kevin say it. The building that we bought used to be a uh, boat showroom and storage, right? Mm-hmm. And the CEO of this building has boat sales only. <clears throat> We're trying to take that out. But to do that, it's a long, lengthy process. Correct? Correct. So what do you think? Like, what is what do you think is going to happen? Are we even going to be able to open here? We might have to open somewhere else. What do you think? I mean, it's turning out to be a long and slow process. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to abide by all the town's requirements. Um, but sometimes those requirements keep changing. Um, like, they don't give it to us all at once. So we know about some, then we don't know about others, and we try to tackle certain ones, and then... All the ones come up, and I'm sure Rod has already told everyone the newest requirement was the fire sprinkler requirement, which we didn't know about until just um, recently. So, which it costs a lot of money. Which costs a lot of money, right? And um, so we're just trying to work with the town and figure out: is there any other way that we can get around those requirements? You know, perhaps they can accept a fire alarm system. Versus an extinguish, you know, fire extinguishing system. Um, I'm sorry, not fire extinguisher. I mean, fire sprinkler system. But other than that, besides that, after that, it's still we ha- we're going through what's called a site plan review, and that takes time where they evaluate everything that you want to do here, making sure that we're all to code on everything. Uh, we have to get a parking variance because the parking lot is not big enough for the size of the building, so they're saying there's not enough parking spots. You know, if we were to open full retail. So that has to go through a whole um, town approval process. And um, what's that? Not co- You don't go to court. You go to a, a hearing. Yeah. A public yep. hearing. That's what it is. And then there's a board that will vote on it. And then you have to, like, let, like, all the residents in a 200, is it 200 mile rate? Not 200 mile, 200, can't be 200 feet. There's some radius, 200 feet for 500 feet. You have to mail them a flyer to notify them of this town hearing, and they have the right to go and voice their opinion, whether yay or nay, we want them there, we don't want them there. So it's a whole big process. And then they'll schedule it, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, it'll be in six months, and then you got to wait six months for it. Correct. You know, that's why they say doing business in New York is so tough because there's so many of these regulations and stuff like that that you have to follow, And and it's expensive. And that's not even the whole problem. I mean, we can't say it's all the town. You know, we're also trying to conduct business and keep afloat, right? So it's not like I can devote every day towards this process, right? We still have to bring in our fish, take care of the fish, sell the fish, do the videos, do this podcast. You know, there's a lot of things going on, and everything has become baby steps. Yeah, yeah. I, I for sure it's taking a lot longer than I expected, though. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it would suck because, like, his facility in L.A., everything was pretty much done. I even remember, like, going there and, like, what's the hardest thing for you to do here? He goes, the hardest thing for me to do is not to fall asleep when I'm doing water change because <laughs> it was so easy. Uh, Florida, we had just finished the whole thing. The whole place was done. So it kind of, like, it sucks to come here and, and just see the place like this every day. And every day you come in and, 
you know, and like, damn, we could have been done already yeah. and traveling the world and, you know, enjoying our lives and doing different things. But every day you come in and it's like you have to, a, a barrier, like a wall in front of you that you have to just wait, you know, until that wall is done. I saw one of my old videos yesterday because it <clears> popped up on Oi's phone and I actually missed my facility because everything was done. Done. Yeah. done. You know, when I look at this place, I'm like, oh my God. The amount of work this still. I mean, if, you know, if you look from when we first came in here, we did a lot already, right? With the sewer, with the insulation, with the roof, with the plumbing, and, you know, but there's so much more to do. We haven't even done a, a third of the, one third of the business. Not even. I mean, the, the facility. Nope. So. It's, it's a lot of work. And unless you've been here, like in person, it looks smaller. I don't know about you guys, but it looks smaller on camera than it does in person. Like this place is huge. Yeah, and I, I think it's so loaded with stuff now everywhere that I don't even see it. Like it's so huge anymore. Like I used to. You feel the same way? Yeah, I, I actually feel it's too small now. With <laughs> all the stuff that's filled over there, even though it's not set up. Once we set all that up out there, where's all that junk gonna go? Yeah. There's nowhere to put that stuff. Yeah. Anymore. You know, when people come and uh, do local pickups and, you know, they come in to get the fish and they're like, wow, this place is way bigger than, than what they thought. And we have to walk them, you know, to the back to get the fish. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're like, home. they're they're amazed. I, I think that it's a great building, but uh, one of the our goals is not just to sell fish. Like, we want to do other things as well. So in the future, if we can come up with another place where we can do, like, an exhibit... You know, like when we did the stingray for the kids in Florida, yeah. to, just to see their happiness and, you know, interacting with them. I think there's a lot of fish out there in, in the whole world that people are killing it or, or eating it or whatever they're doing with it. That If we could have a uh, exhibit or a conservatory where we can get these animals in, I think it would be really nice. It's like yeah. stuff that you see uh, once in a lifetime, you know, uh, like fella, you know, the white turtle. Mm -hmm. Um Things like that, you know, people don't have the money to see it. So it would be cool to have one place where they can see everything. Yeah, and that's even stuff that you wouldn't see at an aquarium either because, right. you know, aquariums are, a lot of them take, like, fish rescues and want to exhibit, like, regular fish in the wild. But when you get into these color morphs and these, like, yeah. not unnatural types of fish. Where, where are you going to see your $100,000 stingray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <coughs> But no, our partner in China, sometimes he sends us videos that it's like, I go crazy. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's get it. Let's get it. And Kevin's like, we're not ready. We're not ready. We're not ready. You know, he's more of like the the stable person and I'm the unstable going, yeah, let's get it. <laughs> um, remember that one time he showed us a, um, it was a giant Mekong stingray. You've seen though, that's the biggest the, fish the in the world. They get like 10 foot diameter, right? Albino. Oh, albino, what? bro. And... I went nuts for it. I wanted to get it for him as a gift. And um, we decided not to do it because we weren't ready. Is that the one that Jeremy Wade caught on River Monsters? Yeah. The one that like was giving birth while he, was, while he caught it? Those are unbelievably massive. Remember? Yeah. Um, he showed us a giant, a platinum giant trevally. Platinum. Pure white with black eyes. And I went nuts for it. I was like, no, man, we need it. It's crazy. You know. Aren't those salt water? They are, but they can live in fresh too. Oh, it's like bumblebee okay. groupers. If you if you do the right uh uh um acclimation uh, uh, water parameters, you can get them. And I believe you can have freshwater fish in salt water if the salinity is very low, and vice versa. Yeah, that's why you see videos on sometimes they have sharks with arowanas and arapaimas. It, it's very doable. Um. I found out in Florida when I had the saltwater tank, I I was having a problem with the white parasite and nobody knew what it was and I was just getting into saltwater. All the fish that we put in would die, but the sharks, the eels, and the groupers would live. So one day, I used to just fill it up that tank with fresh water. Where every time the water was evaporating, I would just open the the filter water in, and I forgot it open all night. Remember? And, so so you would fill it with fresh water and then you'd mix the salt solution? No, no, no. Or you I just would, fill it no, with he fresh? he was just topping off the tank. Because uh, once, once the water evaporates, okay. the salt... Oh, the, right, the minerals stay right. in the water. So I would just, okay. you know, add fresh water. But I forgot it open, and I went home. So all night, it fresh, fresh water was coming in and all the salt water was overflowing the tank. So the next morning, like, the water was all over the floor. 
and I did a, a salinity test kit, and it was zero. There was zero salinity left, and all the, the fish were still alive. I think that a lot of fish can tolerate one or the other for a certain amount of time. Right. Yeah, because, like, bull sharks and, like you were saying, I guess the trevallies, too, uh, the, you know, a lot of times they migrate into freshwater to to reproduce and stuff like that so they can well, tolerate it. I had an Atlantic tarpon that I bought it from Thailand. Yeah, tarpon's another one. Five, six years. It was about this big when I gave them away. And full fresh water. It's the same thing with striped bass, too. Like, here up in the northeast, stri striped bass is one of the biggest... It's the biggest saltwater game fish that you could go for. Basically, like an inshore game fish. And... People think of it as like a saltwater fish because you go out, you know, into the back bays or you go into the ocean, wherever you want to catch them. But they migrate up rivers to reproduce and they go into fresh water. So a lot of a lot of fish are able to tolerate a very wide range of like different mineral and salinity contents and, yeah. and stuff. Unless it's a there's I mean, there's really very few fish that are very picky when it comes to water quality from what I, from what I've seen. Like it, de it depends on how you acclimate them. And also, like, how wide of a range you put them in, from my experience, at least. Well, he's the master there. He's been doing it for longer than us, right? So, well, master. I mean, one of the reasons why I didn't want to get that giant trevelli was because I was concerned about long-term being in fresh water, and it's such an expensive fish. It was. Yeah. You know? But it you was don't amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was really nice. Um, and it wasn't tiny either. So if those people over there didn't know how to handle it, oh, it's good and fresh, and then they just take it right out of salt and dump it in fresh, pack it to ship, it might not even get here alive. Yeah. So but you spend thousands on this fish that <clears throat> dies in transit and That's you're it. out of money. So it was too risky. Yeah. But yeah, we definitely see things that we never seen before. I think one of our goals is to get this place done and then start traveling. And go even possibly pick these fish up for yourselves and make and ship them back for yourselves. I mean, and like, if I had a private plane and I was that rich, I would love to go to the Amazon and, like, right when they're catching the fish and they're all going to kill them to eat, I'll be like, all right, I'll buy that one, that one, and put in my private plane, bring it back, yeah. you know, just watching my pond. I did a, I used to have a moving company in Florida, and I did a move with this guy. He had a huge house, but next to it, he had a pond that i never seen it like that before. It was deep in the ground, and he had the bridge growing over it to, like, an island in the middle where he had a barbecue set up. But all around it was water. So, like, it oh, was really sick. beautiful, natural, really tall, like, really deep. And all he put in there was, like, very expensive koi. I was like, man, I would have put an aeropium, a tiger shovel, everything, every monster fish that I could catch, I would put it in here. But uh, he ended up taking the pond down because of uh, an otter was coming in and killing all his koi. And each koi was, like, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. In Florida? Koi. Yeah. Yeah, he lost a lot of money on the otters. Jeez. There's a house um, around the block from where we used to live, actually, where there's a lake, and it was just, it was set up just like it, but it was a natural lake, and there was an island in the middle with a big gazebo, and one of the houses that are on this lake has a bridge that goes to the gazebo, and they have the big lake that surrounds it, and um, when we were young, my dad wanted to buy that house, and he never went through with it, and I keep thinking to myself, like, damn it, I fucking wish I had that house. I'd buy every single fish and just throw it right in the pond. Even though it, I think if it's a natural pond, you're not really supposed to, you can't really release it. Um, I don't know how that works if it, cause it's not like, a, um, it's not a public waterway or anything. It's a closed, it's enclosed, right? it's an enclosed lake, but it's not like one person owns the lake. Yeah. There's a couple houses on it. Um, you know, it's not like you go to a park, but I so I don't know how that works. If it was your property and the lake was in your property, then you can do whatever you want. As long as there's nothing uh, uh, prohibiting it. Yeah, because there's a lot of laws and regulations with releasing fish. And also, I think the, the fish cannot have any any um, ways to escape into, like, a main canal. Mm. That was one of the big things. But in Florida, I think the reason why a lot of the fish are prohibited is because even they're worried about a bird grabbing it and flying over and dropping it on another lake. You know, mm -hmm. it's just everything's going to be. I feel like in the future, everything's going to be illegal there. <laughs> Probably. It already is for a, a lot of fish. Well, that's where I left. <clears throat> yeah, like you go into, we have a house in Cape Coral, and you go to the canals over, they're freshwater canals that lead into saltwater, they're just tilapia and peacock bass everywhere, you yeah. know, and they're they're not native to Florida. No, but peacock bass, 
Fish from All Life put it in the water. Oh, yeah? They did it themselves, yes. Oh. Because of, uh, think about how much money they make on fishing. I guess fishing. And they're very similar to largemouth bass, which are already there. So they probably don't affect the ecosystem. Like No, I think they put a lot of species in there, but with the cold, only the, the butterfly mixed with cowberry lived. It's all hybrids by this point. It's nothing. I don't think you agree. I don't think it's any like pure because they put tamensis, they put cowberries, they put the butterfly. And all you see right now is butterfly, but some of them are not even. Well, it depends. Know. I think they're all hybrids fish, at this point. Fish in the wild, they know to breed within their species. But what so. if there's not a female that looks like them and there's another female that looks good on the other side of the pond? Yeah, that's yeah. What, well. <laughs> yeah. If you only have those two, where it's male and female, then yeah, it's gonna happen. But I think when they have a choice, they they stick to their own. Interesting. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll take his word over your word. I don't know, because <laughs> I was there. I, I I only see fish that look like a butterfly, but a lot of them already hybridized. Like you, you look at them, you're like, it's not a normal butterfly peacock bass. I'm so bad with peacock bass. I can't tell any of them apart. They all look like I could see the differences, obviously, but like if you ask me what's what, I have no clue. I think a lot of people, even in Brazil, they don't know. Like when I went to the, the Amazon, there's four or five types of tamensis that they follow, you know. But for us here, we only know of one, you know, like normal, everybody's the speckled tamensis. Mm -hmm. But there's a bigger one that is doesn't have any speckles, it's just the bars. And that's the one I caught. And there's other ones that are like hybridized now. You know, those two together makes another species. So there's there's gonna always gonna be new fish coming out. Do you agree with that? You think there's always gonna be new fish being born um, through hybridization? Yes, mm -hmm. but uh, but they might to have something up. new species pop up. I don't think so. It Unless it's be. been undiscovered. I think it's there, just yeah, yeah, not found yet. Yeah, yeah but it, look, <clears throat> how did peacock bass came around? There might there, something might happen, and some other species is gonna come around, and we're gonna be like, "Holy crap!" It doesn't come often, but mm -hmm. you never know. Yeah. Or like a species that's critically endangered, that is very unaccessible, might someone might find the key to breeding it in captivity, and all of a sudden now you got a new fish on the market, yeah. you know, or or something like that. So you know, that's know. one of the things we want to do in the future if we can uh, breed and you know put it back in the wild or you know conservatory, do that type of work. <laughs> I never really wanted to open a store to sell fish. I wanted to open a store for me to get my own stuff without my wife killing me. That was the number one goal, but yeah. it became a business out of it. Um, but I don't necessarily enjoy having a fish store. I, I would like to do something different than that. Do you I, agree? Yeah, I mean, what we do now, we're like a slave to the, the fish. We can't even get away for a day. So it's, it's, it, it'll take your toll you know, on you. I mean, yeah, you you you're there with selling the the aqua products. You know, it's you see uh, how it is. Trying. They're not live. Yeah, it, it's like if if I had a preference, I would much rather keep it a hobby than to make it into a business. But you know, I see what people achieve. You know, in in this industry, and I have the connections. Like I know, obviously, I know you guys going to Aquashella. I met so many different people. Like. People who run these giant corporations and other content creators, and I see what they're doing, and that just pushes me because I'm, I'm really just doing stuff I would have done anyway, you know. So I'm like, whatever, screw it. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing, even though like I'm still trying to get the business going and trying to like, it, it's tough. Like, it, just like what you're going through. Every week, it's just like another thing pops up, and it's just like I got to take care of that, and that takes three weeks or a month before I could start going to the next thing and the next thing. And I'm laying out all this money, and it's just like, you know, I keep having to lay money out. And, you know, I would only do this for fish keeping. I wouldn't do, like, if there was just, if it was like opening a restaurant or like opening something, I, I would have been done two years ago. I would have never kept doing this. But I see, because I could see the end goal, and I could see, you know, I could see myself doing this and just for fun, you know? And what, even if I just break even or if I don't make money, I'd still be doing it. So that's what keeps me going. Would you be doing it if you break even? Um, we're still here, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we're still doing it. Um, nah, it sucks. Sometimes you think you're going to make money, and it's just like... It is so tough to start a business, and especially look, for you guys. If it wasn't for him, I probably would have would have quit. I probably would have just said, hey, no, I'll just import my own stuff. I don't care about opening a store. Yeah. 
if it wasn't for him, because he had his connections, he had the knowledge, he taught me a lot. Um, it's very hard for anybody to get in the business, especially without knowing anybody. Like I, my goal was never to to be a store to copy somebody. I just wanted, I just created something from my own vision to for me to get my own fish. Because you back then, a lynx was like what thousand fifteen hundred dollars. Nobody had a lynx catfish. You know, Perun shark. What the hell is that? I, I remember watching videos on YouTube, falling asleep, and Lisa was like, "Shut that off." I'm like, "No, hold on, <laughs> let me enjoy it." You ever uh, fall asleep and the, the, drop the phone on your face? Yeah, I had done that. <laughs> My aquatic diaries, I used to watch them all the time. When he built the 60,000-gallon pond, I'm like, man, this is like a dream. And then after I opened up and all, you know, a few years went by, he said he watched all our videos, which was pretty cool wow. to, to be like, damn, I wanted to be this guy. And then this guy's actually following us, which is pretty cool. But I don't know. I think fish in general, there's so much, you know, to teach these kids these days, like with pollution or... You know, conservation, like the kids in that school, man, like, you know, you changed their life that day, teaching them something about two stingrays that they never seen before. So I think yeah. that's why the main reason why we do it. And, uh, you know, if we can bring happiness to people as well, like, I think one of the things that I think it's cool is when someone is getting a fish and they just like go crazy over that fish. Like it's, it means so much for them. You know, that was me. Last week when I got, I got these new fish from, you guys know Ryan from Wild Fish Tanks. He's got a YouTube channel. Um, I got these. We're fish getting fish somewhere else. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you scared the shit out of me. I was. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that was, that was an honest reaction. Bro. Dude, I was not expecting. I'm just chilling in the corner. I'm like, kind of like falling asleep a little bit. I was just relaxing. You just grab <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I got these fish because I mean, you know, he's got some fish that you guys don't have. So I was just you know, kidding. I was just kidding. You know, I was kidding. <laughs> First, I was gonna say you're not talking about the paddlefish, but then I no, I just no, switched dude, it. I love that paddlefish though. I'm in the spring. I'm I want to set up a nice big above ground pond, and I want to get some sturgeon too, and make a nice like prehistoric pond. But the fish I was talking about, it's called a um, and th they're like sort of common. They're invasive in Florida. They're called a pike top minnow. And mm. they're live bearing predators. They look like a pike. I think I sold them before. You you might have. They're not super common yeah. because they're pretty territorial and aggressive. They look just like a a, a, a minnow, no collar, but with teeth. Yes, that yes, they have a mouth like a pike, yeah. but they look like a minnow, like the body's like a minnow. And I just love fish like that because they're live bearers. But you'd never think a live bearer would have sh be an aggressive predator with live teeth like that because that's what they eat. You know, like how do those fish survive? So when I got these, when I found out that he was getting them, and these are like almost full grown ones that are a breeding pair. And I ordered them and I got them. And it's just a new thing that I've never kept before. Cause like you were saying before, I've had the neon tetras, I've kept discus, I've kept all these different types of fish. I love unique, cool fish like that. So when I got these, I was like, oh my God, that's sick. I even, I made, I put a video on YouTube and I also did an Instagram reel, which and it got like a million views now. And, and on TikTok too, it's up to like a million and like 30,000 likes. And just people are like, dude, that fish is sick. Like that thing is awesome. And then there's some people commenting like, oh yeah, I'm down in Florida. I have them in my backyard. Like those things are all over the place. But like you never, most people have never seen that fish before. And for some reason, it's just not in the hobby, but it's an, a very easy fish to breed. And they're super, super tolerant of water conditions. That's why they're, they've bred in Florida, but they're just so cool. You know, but that, going back to what you were saying, like, you know, that's what kind of keeps me going in the hobby, getting those really unique fish that you don't see very often. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I could choose a fish to own, like, you know, if I put it in my house, it would be an Asian or water. If they were allowed. That yeah, guy right there? That guy right there. I love Asian arowanas too. Dude, that's... The colors they get out of them is unreal. I remember the first time I saw one, and, you know, this was like the the early days of YouTube, I saw one that was like blood red. And I was like, that fish is fake. Like that's a fake fish. And then you start seeing more videos and pictures. You see a gold one, you see a green one. I don't know what the names of all these are, but it's, it's crazy. No, I was just is, sitting here daydreaming. Is that <laughs> I'm just thinking about like how I've completely lost touch to like what it was like when I first started and the passion you have for the fish. I can now think back and remember just sitting there and staring at any little fish. Like you said, it could be the ugliest thing. 
It could have been a common fire mouth cichlid. Or, and I'm just like completely in awe by it. Every single fish, you know, I it's like I feel like I'm, I don't have that anymore. It's because I'm disconnected from that. Because it became a business, well, not a hobby anymore. That passion, you know? That's that's what I'm worried about is like, you know, I, I think about it every day. I'm like, do I want to, do I really want to pursue this business and turn my hobby into a business and make it where I don't enjoy it? Or do I want to just keep it casual and like if the business does well, keep, you know, then pursue it, but it's, it's, not turn my hobby into a business. It's tough. It's tough to separate both. I mean, you know? I still enjoy it. I, I think you still enjoy it. Um, it's just there's more responsibility around it now because we're dealing with so much of it. Yeah. But if I were to actually stop and like look at a tank, I could sit there and appreciate the fish. It's just you right just now we're not time for that. Yeah. Right now we're not. You're not looking at these tanks to appreciate. You're looking at these tanks to keep them alive. To you know, so you can make money, pay the bills. So it's different. But if you had, like, like this one guy call me, and um, he said he's he's gonna be homeless soon. And uh, he's, he straight up said it just like that. He said, if I pay you, can you hold my Oscar for me until, like, I'm back on my feet? And I'm like, holy crap. Like, you, you're going to be on the streets, and you care about this fish that, you know, doesn't even cost that much, you know. I mean, probably doesn't mean nothing for anybody else. But for him, that fish, man, it's all he got, yeah. you know. So I was like, I was like, yeah, I can hold it for you. You don't have to pay me anything. But, you know, if anything happens, I don't want to be responsible for it, you yeah. know. But it's like, you know, you would never think of somebody who call and say something like that. Maybe, oh, $10,000 fish or $5,000 fish. Okay, I don't want to get rid of it. But, like, a $5, $10 fish? You know, people, especially with fish and reptiles, too, people, like, they don't sympathize. a lot Unless you have a fish that has a personality, a lot of people don't sympathize with fish. Like they do with dogs and cats because we, you know, we could relate to them. They're mammals. They're playful. They could remember people. But a lot of cichlids and a lot of like the little bit smarter fish will remember people. They'll remember faces. Like my fish, when I walk in my room, they know I'm going to feed them. They know who I am. If someone else walks in, they know that they're not going to, they don't know who they are. You know, so it's like you could build, you could like almost build a relationship with the fish almost. So like a lot of the puffer fish are very smart. They'll remember you. So like, yeah, you, it, you know, I think of it almost like a dog or a cat, like they're your, you know, they're a companion, you know? I think people that are into the hobby, they're born like that. Because in Florida, I had kids come over and their mom's like, oh, my kid ready to come here and go to, you know, there's no world. And some of these little kids, they knew everything, like what the fish was, what they ate, like everything. So like me, I was born in Brazil. I was raised on a place like Key West. I, every day I'm surrounded by fish. You know, so I fell in love with them. Um, I think they're just an underground world that we don't live in. So it's cool to see something that you've never seen before. Yeah. That was like me when I was young. I had this book that my dad gave me from the 80s. You might, you guys might have even seen it. It's, I'm it not was from like, the 80s. <laughs> well, I think it was made in the 80s, but it's a very popular. I think it was like the Encyclopedia of Freshwater Fish. The thing was like this big. And it had color pictures of a fish in it. Yep, the blue book, right? I it think was, it was blue. Yep, the Axelrod book. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just finish the story real quick. So it, I would go through this thing every day, and I'd bring it to the pet store. I'd be like, oh, do you have this fish? Do you have this fish? Like, this, does this fish go with this fish? And, I, and the guy at the pet store would be like, probably like, get this effing kid out of here. Like, this kid, <laughs> he's just like asking all these questions. But, like, that's how I got into it, you know? Um, and that's... I was introduced to it young and, you know, you see all these fish and it's cool, you know. It's definitely different. It's a different world that I um, hope other people can enjoy as well. Yeah. You know, bringing in, like, stuff they've never seen before. Like, my favorite's right here. That, to me, just for fish to have that power and be that big, it's, like, amazing. Crazy. Um, But if I if we, if we leave for favorites for another day, I think that yeah. this, this podcast has been over an hour. I think it was a good uh, first podcast, right? Bad, yeah. Yeah. Um, our idea is uh, every Thursday, we're probably going to either do the podcast on Thursdays or go live on Thursday so you guys can interact with us. If you have questions, you know, like take care of Stingray or tanks or monster fish, we can talk about different subjects. Yeah. But um, we're basically dedicating this time for you guys because you're always there supporting us and everything that we do. 
Um, yeah, so whatever, can... whatever, like, if you have any suggestions, you can leave it in the comments of, like, what you want to see. We have a lot of different ideas and, like, different paths that we want to go down. Like, we want to have cool guests. Like Rob was saying, we want to interact with the audience. Um, so whatever, if you could think of anything, just leave it in the comments, and we're, we'll try to do it, you know. And it, it, if this works out good, you know, we'll start, I think, one one day a week for now. But, like, if, it, if people really like it, maybe we could expand it, like... We're really open to to do whatever you guys want. And then you had an idea too about like having like a members um, section where we'll talk about more in depth and a different thing, like teaching. Yeah, teaching, and, educating, and, and helping, advice. Right. So I think once we get the the portion, uh, once John gets that um, the the live interaction thing set up, also we can even do live consultation. Right. In in the live, but it would be like a membership thing. Maybe. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people call to save their fish. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, my, I'm like, did you did you get it from us? No, I got it from this place. I'm like, well, try giving them a call and see what they say, you know? So I think that a lot of people, we try to help everybody, but I think a lot of people would love to have that, you know, 24, not 24 hours, but like that fast service. Like, I'm my fish is dying right now. What can I do? You know, and sometimes you, you can save a fish. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Just like us, you know, that unfortunately they're gonna make it and not make it. It's it's gonna happen to all of us. Okay. So fish are not any different. That's it. All right, so that was good. Yeah, I guess yeah. we're good. All right. Cool all right. job, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks, John, for setting us up. Thanks for you to uh setting up the room. No problem. Thanks, Kevin, for your smuggling uh <laughs> killing stingray story. <laughs> and uh Hopefully you guys enjoyed and uh, we're wanna do it every week, like you said, you know, and yep. it would be cool to to be able to interact. Right now, we're trying to figure out how we can FaceTime people all over the world to join the live. Um, we, we don't know if we're just going to do a, a, what do we say we're going to do? A Zoom. So we'll have like a code. You can get in. Maybe we'll figure out if we put the screen there or there so it's, we can see you as well mm -hmm. as, we're t as we're talking to you. All right. If you cool. have any comments, any suggestions, let us know. Appreciate the love. And we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks, guys. <laughs>